Uh, and if you checked Slack this morning, um, I did put up a, uh, a possible opportunity. I'm going to be working on a um, programming based, let's call it research project. Um, it's actually kind of a video game uh, type of idea. Um, should be a pretty good experience if that's something that you are interested in getting involved with. Um, either email me or send me a private message on Slack so I can add you to the list. And once I have, uh, I'll, I'll probably close uh, the the uh, um, interests, you know, maybe noon tomorrow or something, and then I'll set up a, a meeting to kind of pitch the idea to everybody and then we can decide if you're interested or not interested, but it involves computer programming and game stuff. All right, so let's pick up where we left off last time. Um, so we started talking about assembly specifically. So last time we were talking about the um, some binary stuff and um, you know why these things exist for the difference between human beings and computers and you know we've invented mechanisms that live between us and the computer to make our uh, ability to tell the computer what to do easier. And specifically, since we're dealing with mobile uh, architecture in here, and you've previously looked at a, uh, I've done some research on ARM versus Intel, right? Um, just to kind of get the lay of the land so we know what we're dealing with here. So these are two separate architectures that really are not direct competitors uh, because they live on different kinds of devices. So the Intel processors, the direct competitor for Intel would be like the AMD processors, which are you know, a, a, a compatible chipset with a couple of magic tricks that set them apart. Same thing's true over on the Intel side. Um, but ARM primarily lives on um, mobile devices as well as some embedded systems. Um, uh, so with that in mind, we don't necessarily uh, have to uh, like worry about ARM taking over uh, the desktop or the laptop uh, market, you have started seeing some of these ultra portable um, uh, laptops uh, have some ARM processors in them because you know the idea is that they they do run uh, like Windows 10. Windows 10 has an ARM version of it now. Um, that's not the thing you would get if you're going to be playing video games and stuff on it, but um, you know, they've ported most of their uh, um, business applications over. So if you need something that's kind of roughly the size of like an iPad, but you'd need it to not be a, an iPad, you need it to be like the Windows um, interface. That's, that's what your business would need, let's say. You know, you, can f you might find some of those with either a, historically it would have been a little bit low, lower powered Intel chip um, more recently, you've seen a transition towards ARM chips um, because by nature, they are lower powered uh, because they were designed to run mobile devices. Um, even more interesting, I guess, is recently uh, Apple. So this is um, called this end of 2020. Apple computers released a laptop and a Mac mini, which is running a chip called M1. All right, anybody know anything about this M1 chip? Um, do you know any details? Anything about it? So the machine learning part, it does have a built-in uh, AI AI engine. So one of its features is it's kind of uh, set up to be a, a, a it's it's positioned to do artificial intelligence stuff as that becomes more and more of a thing. Okay, uh, what else were you saying? Okay, so very modern technology. 
Apple's always bragging about their, you know, manufacturing process. You know, when the Apple watches first came out, they were talking about how they made the different alloys, the metals for the watches and all the commercials had the, you know, pouring molten aluminum and stuff like that. And you know, it's, it's, it's metal. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, anybody online uh, can add anything to the M1, uh, your knowledge about the M1 chip? It's actually pretty interesting and pretty related to what we're talking about in here. And I specifically put the year in case we, you know, future people are looking at these slides. <laughs> nothing, we got nothing. All right, it, it is ARM based. So it's an ARM based chip. compatible with Apple's iOS applications. Um, so IE, you will be able to run iPad and iPhone apps natively on the machine. So that's one interesting thing. Um, might be helpful, might not. I know there is sometimes there's apps that I actually prefer my phone versus going to the website or something like that. But you know, this will be situationally beneficial. Um, there's also maybe, you know, a, a handful of of apps or games or something like that that are only available on mobile and maybe you want to uh, play it on your desktop or or maybe since we're talking about laptops mostly here I mean the the, the Mac mini is more just an extra side thing that's a desktop based um, call it entry level Mac uh, doesn't have a screen or anything built in it, they've been around for a little bit but it's effectively a, a small computer maybe the um, you know size of a medium sized plate, something like that, and probably a couple inches tall. Um, so very convenient to put it somewhere. And it's a reasonably powered Mac that you hook up to your own keyboard, own, uh, own mouse and laptop uh, screen and stuff. Uh, but generally we're talking about the laptop uh, version of this. So the first one is the 13 inch MacBook, 13.3 um, uh, inch MacBook Air and the 13.3 inch MacBook Pro that run this M1 chip. Um, it is ARM based. Now, the interesting history here is Apple, once upon a time, almost failed as a company um, when they, um, well, prior to this, Apple almost failed as a company when they started uh, making their stuff less proprietary. Okay. Um, so they were always making their own hardware and, and only software that ran on it. And that's kind of Apple's uh, you know, DNA, let's say. Um, and then once they started letting people make uh, Mac compatible hardware that you could run the Mac OS on and stuff like that, then they started taking profits away from the company because now you had other places to go and places were undercutting the prices. And so Apple almost failed as a company. Then they ended up, you know, remember they had fired Steve Jobs before that. They ended up bringing him back in, not by hiring him, but by acquiring Next Computers. Um, but one of the big moves that Apple made back then was a move to go from, let's call it a more proprietary chip. They were running the PowerPC processor, which was made by Motorola and um, IBM was also manufacturing it. Um, so they moved from the PowerPC processor, which was a risk based processor, reduced instruction set, just like ARM is. All right, so we can say historically, Apple computers ran on power PC processors, which were risk-based like ARM. They weren't ARM. This is the predated ARM. Actually, maybe it didn't actually predate ARM. It predated ARM becoming popular. All right. Um, I don't actually know when the original person came up with this ARM instruction set and said, hey, this is a good idea. Sometimes things are ahead of their time, right? 
um, you know, because ARM really came into its own once we started having expectations of relatively powerful computers in our pockets running off batteries. That's where ARM shines is you're like, hey, we got a lot of horsepower here and it doesn't kill my battery. Where if you were running a, you know, Intel Core i7 processor in your smartphone, probably not going to get great battery life uh, is the idea. So historically, Apple uh, ran these PowerPC processors and they made a move to Intel, which made all of the software you had for your Mac stop working. Why? If uh, Apple, so this is based on what we talked about the last couple of classes, if, if Apple had all the software, so if you were you know, running any Macintosh software or whatever, even a Mac OS um, on your Power, Power PC based uh, Mac, and then all of a sudden you go and get a new Mac that is running Intel processors instead, all the software that you spent all this money on no longer works. Why? Compiler. Yep. So. Yep. So compilers require two things. They need to know the operating system and they need to know the architecture. So all the software applications were compiled for the, we'll call it right OS, but wrong architecture. They were compiled for the power PC architecture. So any of these applications that you had in your machine that you bought at Best Buy or whatever back then, or even Sears sold software back then, um, you know, all of a sudden these things would stop working when you got your new Mac. Cause you're like, oh, I'm gonna go get a new Intel based Mac and everything's great. It's the best thing since sliced bread and none of your stuff worked. Okay, because all that software, you know, they when you buy a piece of software, they don't send you the source code and tell you to compile it yourself, right? You know, if you're in the Linux world, you do that. You download source code, you can compile it, all this stuff. But hey, if you're a Windows or a Mac user, you get a little setup icon, right? You double click that setup icon and it installs crap, right? <laughs> the magic occurs. And that comp I promise the compilation stuff happened beforehand. Galib, it's going dark. Come on, man. Well, because you moved a little bit, or maybe Galib did do a little bit from home. I'm hacking. He did something. You got you to gotta do it better, dude. <laughs> Maybe if you dance a little bit. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll keep trekking here. We got partial light. It's probably, it's fine. Yeah, so Galeeb broke the lights. Maybe it'll stay on now. Yeah, he's gonna. gonna <laughs> Gleeb's like, look, it's a little bit darker, but it's still got some light, and now they'll never go off. <laughs> These are just permanently on now. All right. Uh, so all the stuff uh, stopped working because they made that switch. Now, in hindsight, we can say that was one of the best decisions Apple made is switching from Power PC to Intel. Um, uh, a, there were some problems with manufacturing the PowerPC chips. And um, so there wasn't an innate weakness. To, there were some benefits to the, like the uh, Apple G3, Apple G4. The last processor was the G4 processor that was PowerPC based. And it had this technology on it called Altimec, which was a precursor. I kind of remember, I maybe I mentioned that in class here early, the, one of the earlier weeks. You know, there's, everything comes out of my mouth is gold. So sometimes I forget you know, what's, what's flowed out in the class and what hasn't. So if I say it a second time, it must be amazing. Is that, <laughs> so it had a technology in it called Altivec, 
which was like a precursor to um, uh, the thing that uh, Intel calls hyper-threading. Um, um, now, I think they actually just put the word turbo <laughs> on their stuff. Turbo is actually a little bit different. It's a hyper-threading with some other stuff on top of it, which effectively allows the processor to uh, overclock itself for small bursts. Um, let's not get down that rabbit hole. I'll spend an hour and a half talking about overclocking and stuff. Um, let's stay on stay on task here. But in in any case, we're gonna in hindsight we're gonna say this was a smart move that uh, that Apple made. Let me start another slide so the uh, font doesn't get too small here. Apple made a smart move going to Intel. You know, when you think about processors, one of the first words that comes to mind is Intel, right? You know, so when we think about CPUs, we think about Intel pretty quickly, right? It's kind of like when somebody says, do a web search, you think about Google, you know, we're gonna Google it. We were in a little bit different time then, so I'm not sure people threw around the word Intel like that, but they would call it the Pentium. Pentium processors were uh, Intel's first. That was Intel's major jump forward. So prior to the Pentium processors, we had some older architecture. Uh, and again, I don't want to get too far into this because this is more desktop uh, operating system stuff. And I know there's tons of overlap, right? Because a computer is a computer, but I want to start angling towards the uh, the idea of, of mobile specific but we had the x86 the 286 the 386 the 486 processor and then within those you had you know the sx the the dx the dx2 you had you know stuff <laughs> yeah these were these were uh you know the, each one was a little upgrade to the guy before it and they all had megahertz ratings or whatever the first uh, pentium processor i believe ran at 60 megahertz um, and it actually had a bug in it. Uh, that's kind of a, another whole history story. But, um, but in any case, that was a major jump forward that Pentium-based architecture uh, increased the performance of computers drastically, drastically of those chips. But thank you. I was really wondering what my battery life of my watch was. <laughs> See, technology is great. Right? I see, I look, I said everything that comes out of my mouth is gold, even the watch thinks so. It was so flustered. <laughs> it just started giving me stuff about battery life. <laughs> All right, so uh, in any case, we're gonna say that Apple made a smart move. Cool kid was Intel. Cool kid today still is Intel, right? I mean, you have the uh, AMD uh, fan people and now AMD has some pretty decent, uh, uh, gaming processors because they've really done um, some interesting stuff with multi-core uh, processors. But at the end of the day, King is still Intel. Uh, maybe we could say at the very, 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 uh, actually what we could probably say is that the prosumer sweet spot, it's probably a fairly close call between the two of them. If you go top of the line, don't look at the price, I'm going to give it to Intel. Yeah, um, their, their decked out i9 is expensive. Okay. <laughs> it's a, actually, I'm pretty sure there's an i9 in this. Yeah, eight core i9 in this laptop. Yeah, this laptop's ridiculous. I mean, that's kind of amazing. I mean, that is a mobile computer thing that this is a laptop with those kind of specs. Um, there's really, really ridiculous what they're able to put into these smaller devices now. <coughs> Excuse me. But in any case, so we're going to say Apple made a smart move moving to like, let's call it the industry standard of Intel. <coughs> so then we're going to say, but in 2020, did they make a stupid move trending back to 
the M1 processor, which Apple manufactures. So there is a difference here, right? When they were doing the PowerPC chips, they were reliant on two other companies. They were reliant on Motorola and they were reliant on IBM. Now, back then, and even still today, both of those companies are major companies, right? Um, especially IBM. I mean, people don't talk about IBM. Well, Dr. Locklear talks about IBM. Um, he's a couple minutes older than me. Um, but when I, even when I was getting into computers, IBM was the, the, the cool kid. Okay, but, uh, you know, Dr. Locklear was around when IBM like first started. So they were the super cool kid back then. So this isn't to take anything about away from IBM. IBM is, they're not going anywhere. They're, no, I think they're playing a different field. Now they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've had, they've been forced to, to, not forced to do that, but that's where their sweet spot is. Their sweet spot has always been hardware. Um, and unfortunately, well, the world of software evolved and they weren't playing in that sandbox. They tried. So when um, Microsoft Windows was popular in the earlier days, um, IBM tried to come up with their own operating system. Anybody know what that was called? Yeah, you know, they tried to come out with a competitor. Okay. Just, uh, I don't know, Something like that. Anybody online? So they had a uh, operating system called OS2. So IBM OS2, um, which was fine. It ran on top of DOS just like Windows did. So what we can really do is we can say that OS2 was um, effectively like having a different windowing environment than, um, and actually I'm probably giving you a bad year for it. It probably was actually more like 1994 because I think OS2 predated Windows 95. Is it AIX? No, it's uh, OS2. Here. Real quick. Pastor Littman, it's Janet, uh, 1993, and I used OS for several years. Okay. I'm older than you. <laughs> yeah, so, and I, I, I was using uh, OS2, uh, you know, I, I dabbled with it. So this came out while Windows 3.1 was, uh, was a thing. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the things they bragged about was that it supported multitasking, where Windows 3.1 did not. Uh, but it was still based on top of, uh, up top of DOS. But... Bottom line is this was IBM saying, hey, software appears to be taking off. We want to play. They did it for 15 minutes, ended up not really working out. Um, not that it was horrible, but Microsoft won. <laughs> you know, that, that, that ship has sailed um, uh, type, type situation. So in any case, uh, um, you know, so in, in, in so if Apple, if we're saying Apple made a smart move in, um, you know, let's see what year would they have made that, uh, that shift probably in 20, 2006-ish, seven-ish. It would have been the original one year after the original OS X. Yeah, so it must have been 2002. So Mac moving to Intel. Two thousand five. All right. So um, I guess we're three or four versions of OS X N all running on PowerPC and then Apple announces we're switching to Intel. Um, they had to then release an Intel version of OS X 
but they also released with that something called the blue box, which was a uh, virtual machine um, that translated between uh, that allowed you to run your PowerPC based Mac applications on an Intel based Mac at a cost of speed. Uh, and if you were on a, a laptop, definitely battery life. Yeah, if you're on a virtual machine, uh, you know, like I run parallels on my computer here, I get a very different experience if I'm running that off of a battery versus plugged into the wall. Um, it's a convenience type thing, not a power consumption benefit types type situation. Um, <clears throat> but in any case, uh, so we're going to say that uh, they made a smart move back then. Obviously, it worked out pretty well for Apple. Apple's had a, a nice run uh, since that move. And it's not just because of that move. You had some, you know, the iPod, iPhone, iPad, a bunch of, bunch of stuff uh, in there that, that had been kind of hits, right? But now, just recently, they said, we're going back to the M1 processor. Well, we're going to back to a different processor, a non-Intel processor. It's, it's an ARM-based processor. Um, now we can say that at the very least, Apple's no longer reliant on another company, right? Um, but Apple today is kind of like the IBM from back then, you know, they're, they're the big, you know, the, 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 the big, big dog, right? Um, or at least one of the big dogs. Uh, so do you think they're making a mistake switching back to a non-Intel based processor? Um, why or why not? Correct, but their newest laptop, their newest MacBook Pro is running the M1 chip. Right. Yep. Yep. So, but uh, for now. For now. Yeah. Yep. So, so, so on one hand, we're going to say there's going to be a transition period, right, where they're both going to exist. Um, because even though Apple already has a MacBook Pro that's running the M1 chip, um, you're, you're saying that their highest line is probably still going to need to be reliant on Intel for now. Right, but but with an idea that we're, I mean, uh, the the underneath the hood, M1 has had shockingly good performance, and the biggest difference there is is that the M1 is doing that translation between uh, uh, 386 architecture and the M1 ARM architecture at the hardware level, not using a virtual machine. So I got my parents a um, MacBook Pro uh 13 inch with the uh the m1 chip in it and they love it and i promise you they they wouldn't be able to do virtual machine stuff or anything <laughs> my mom double clicks on an icon and hopes something happens <laughs> is, is uh is what is what the deal is and and you know and there's a, a couple of the other students in um um one of my undergrad classes also have a a machine with the m1 chip in it but what, so what's nice right now is you can have consumers who go and buy these things, probably not really understanding that the processors that that's in that is a different architecture, right? Yeah, they're, buying the they're buying the new laptop, right? And everything just still works and seems to be speedy enough, right? In fact, it, in, in many cases, it is, it is faster than last year's Intel based one from a, just a root performance. As you said, it's not going to beat an i9 yet. Right, but we're we're in spitting distance. <laughs> you know, it's it's you know you're not taking a major 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 step back um, doing this. Uh, Apple also then um, controls the manufacturing process, which has done well for Apple over the years. Right, nobody goes to an Apple computer because they're saving money. Right, Apple's considered a premium product. It's like when you go and buy a new car, you're buying the Cadillac is in, instead of the GMC or the Chevy. Um, you know, they're all made by the, 
the same line. So you have Chevy, and then one step up is GMC, and then one step up is Cadillac, right? They all use the same parts and things like that. Usually it's trim that's different. Yeah, so if you go to one of those dealerships, you could buy a Cadillac at the same place as you're buying a GMC at the same place you're buying a Chevy. Um, but typically, what do you expect? The Cadillac is the more luxury thing. You know, you got the, you know, some sort of, some kind of wood they've imported from Brazil or, or something like that, to, you know, to, to, to line your steering wheel with or something like that. Yeah, I'm not sure why those things are needed, but whatever. All right, so maybe Apple's kind of like the Cadillac, right? Uh, whereas, you know, maybe uh, an HP laptop is, is more like a Chevy, but really they both have the same engine in them and, and stuff like that. The difference is, is the, the kind of the build quality and maybe that kind of stuff. Um, but so I'm, I'm going to argue that no, they haven't made a mistake because this is part of Apple's DNA of making their own hardware and their own software, right? Okay. On top of that, Apple gives us their opinion of where they think the future is going. So we're going to say probably not a mistake. Making their own hardware is part of Apple's DNA. And this allows them to not rely on another company used to be IBM and Motorola with the PowerPC chips. And now it has been Intel for their laptops and desktops. Not that there's anything wrong with Intel. Right? It's not like Apple saying, oh, well, Intel's done us wrong and we're gonna we're gonna go away from that. And I mean Intel's a big rich company. I'm sure they have their own, you know, questionable business practices, just like any other big company has. But generally speaking, Intel is considered to be a requirement for most of our modern computers. So Apple is telling us that they think the future of computing will trend towards mobile and away from desktop. Now, this doesn't, you know, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to see this, right? You know, we're, we've been living that for years and years and years. The desktop hasn't gone away. But the people who have desktop computers, what do they use those computers for today? Gaming, rendering, graphic design type stuff. Very specific, specialized applications that just need the extra horsepower, right? All right, so, so think of it kind of like in the manufacturing or the mining world where you got those gigantic trucks you know, that can do stuff where, you know, you, you don't see somebody going and buying one of those and parked at Bayshore uh, Mall, right? <laughs> yeah. It's not for the normal consumer. It's for a, you know, very specific task, you know, gamers who want all the horsepower in the world and, and, and things like that. But generally speaking, the way that we use technology today is in a much more mobile uh, way. At the very least, a high percentage of the way we use computers today involves a battery, right? Because we're, so we're going to call that mobile, um, even though five minutes ago we might have said mobile is really where our smartphones live, where laptops are kind of like a, a, a walking desktop, a desktop you can take with you, which there's some truth to that. But what Apple's doing is it's taking one foot, one step forward and saying, our mobile devices, our laptops, are, they really are going to look more like our iPhones and iPads in terms of architecture than they will like our desktop, the uh, uh, Mac Pro, for example, or the, uh, the iMacs. All right. So Apple's effectively giving their opinion on where they think things are going. And I, I, I mean, my feeling is, is it's probably true, right? 
And Apple over the last uh, 11, 12 years has built up now an ecosystem of people who have become software developers for iPhone and iPad, right? Using the Swift programming language specifically targeting Apple's based uh, ARM chips, the A1, the A2 processors. So the M1 is a less low powered version of that because it's reliant on a bigger battery that's fitting inside of a 13 inch laptop, right? Instead of your smartphone, but it's still the same architecture or at least a superset of that, of that older architecture. Um, so Apple's investing in their, themselves and saying, we think our entire line of stuff is going in this direction. People are already writing iPhone apps. Like why do people write iPhone apps over Android apps? You can make the argument all day long of which is the better device, iPhone versus Android, right? You know, usually I take a poll in class and we did this, you know, several classes ago asking who runs which one. And, you know, it's usually about a 50-50 split, right? You got half the people who run iPhone, half the people who run Android. The only reason it's even a 50-50 split um, is because you have so many different uh, versions of Android where most of the people who are running iPhone are running either the newest or one, one version old or something like that. You know, cause again, they can, you know, it's the premium product. Money is probably less of a, a factor um, for them, but let's just call it 50, 50 for which ecosystem you like better. But if you're a software developer and you want to make money as a software developer, um, you're going to write at least for iPhone maybe for Android as well, unless you just have one of those weird aversions to Apple where like, I just hate everything Apple does. None of my software deserves to run on their hardware. If you want a paycheck, you write stuff for, for iPhone because those are the folks who are buying apps, right? Those, so the, it, it's, the, it's the more affluent ecosystem, just generally speaking, and people are willing to pay for apps more readily on that platform. And you actually notice it for those of you who are iPhone users and maybe more specifically for those of you who have been iPhone and Android users at some point in time, even if you look at the same application, whether the Weather Channel app, the iPhone version is almost always more polished than the Android version. Android just feels a little jankier. Um, and, and, and it's not that it's just natively, I mean, in fact, I prefer Java, the language for making Android apps over Swift now. I liked Objective-C over Java, but that was a fairly close call. I just happened to like Objective-C, kind of on the old, uh, older language. I just like the way they do things, um, personal preference type stuff. But in any case, uh, uh, you know, Apple moving over to their own architecture is effectively an investment in where they think the future is going. And historically, Apple's been pretty good at guessing where the future is going. You know, mobile music was kind of a big deal and smartphones with, you know, where you actually use them for browsing the web and things like that, kind of a big deal. Tablets was a little bit of a gamble, but that's worked out pretty well. Um, so whatever. So we're going to say this is a, a decent idea, um, but ARM is here to stay at least for a while. So Apple is making the physical processors, but they have adopted the ARM architecture to run on those physical processors, right? So there's two sides to that. One is what's the language that's used to communicate with this chip? That's the ARM version, whatever language. And then on top of that, now Apple constructs the processor and, you know, their manufacturing techniques is what leads to, you know, less heat, more heat, more speed, less speed, things like that. Um, decisions about different speed cores. Um, you know, when you uh, looked into Android versus uh, iPhone, you looked into actually, when you looked into the Apple ARM processors versus the Android ARM processors, one of the things like the Snapdragon processors have more cores in it, but you also saw that early on in that all the cores were the same speed and worse battery life. Apple made a pretty quick move to having kind of high, high performance cores and then low performance cores and stuff like that. Now they're all kind of doing those same tricks. All right. 
Um, so this kind of uh, uh, talks about a uh, ultimately ARM is the language that the processor speaks. It's not the programming language used to write code for the processor. And what I mean by that is you can have multiple languages. So what they're pointing out here is that, you know, we have um, what's defined as the ARM standard. We also have the GNU uh, Compiler Connect Collection, GCC, uh, as well as standard compilers, uh, standard assembler, um, AS is the name of the program. And these guys might accept a different, probably very similar syntax but they might name some of the hardware registers on the processors a little bit differently and, and things like that. But you notice like here, we still have four argument scratch processors, R0 to R3, R0 to R3, and then A1 to A4. There's still four of them. We're representing these four processors. We just have different names to talk to them, right? And the reason for that is there's another layer involved here. The layer is the human being Let's just let's skip the high level language for a second. The human being writes some assembly code okay, in a text file. Then they, then they assemble that assembly code and then they link it, which creates the executable. That assembly and the linking process translates what they wrote in the assembly syntax they use, the, the risk or the ARM-esque assembly, it translates it into zeros and ones that the actual CPU understands. So whether I'm using this assembler, this assembler, or, or a standard ARM assembler, doesn't matter. When I say, well, let's just assume that R0 is the same thing as R0 is the same thing as A1. When I'm using that programming language as a human, when I say A1 or when I say R0, the ultimate final instruction will be the same zeros and ones. Right, it's the, the assembler is mapping it to that same zero and one. We're talking about your first register, right? Whatever that's probably zero, 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 right? Something like that. So understand that there is a difference between the assembly language and the architecture. We could have multiple languages that ultimately cook down to, to talk to the same architecture. All right, as a human being, we could also invent our own made up language, right? We can invent our own uh, assembly language. And as long as we then write an assembler that translates our language into native ARM that runs on the CPU, no harm, no foul. In fact, there's a programming language out there called chicken. There's a chicken programming language Let's see if it kind of shows me the, uh, the magic tricks. So think of <laughs> well, I'll just explain it out loud. Um, so in this chicken programming language, it's created this fictitious architecture where it said, here's the 11 things that you might want to do to solve your problems in this program. And what they've done is they've decided that to index those 11 things, if you want to do magic trick once, you say chicken one time. You want to do the second magic trick, you say chicken, chicken. Third magic trick, you say chicken, 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 so on and so forth. So even though it's the stupid language where your final uh, code just is, just is this wall of chickens, it gets assembled actually an interpreter, but it, let's just for our purposes here, it gets assembled into underlying code that has meaning. It's one of those 11 instructions or, or however many instructions it is that we reference by saying chicken some number of times. Very verbose language. Okay. So, so I have a question. Sure. So from a high level to the question, what 
Correct. I create my own assembly language. I have to create the assembler in order for the architecture to understand my assembly language. You create your own assembly language, your own syntax. Yeah. You would then need to create an assembler that translates that syntax into the actual zeros and ones that the CPU understands. Right. Yes. So that assembler, uh, that tester, that assembler, is it, is it like a compiler or like an interpreter? It's it's more like a compiler in that you assemble before you run the program. Interpreters are always during runtime. So an assembler will translate your output of your high level program into, um, so a compiler translates a high level code into low level code, which is assembly language the assembler takes assembly language and translates it into machine code and then you go through something called the linker which actually builds the executable and we have a slide that talks about that here in a few minutes but you know that that's kind of the process so your question was is an assembler more like a compiler or more like a an, an interpreter it's more like a compiler from the perspective that it does it before runtime but it's it translates from a low level language into even a lower level language, I, I guess. But a low level language and machine language both have a one to one relationship with the CPU. This one instruction equals one thing the CPU knows how to do. All right. So, you know, purpose of this slide is to basically say you could have multiple assembly languages that ultimately, ultimately assemble down to machine code for the same architecture. The language isn't important as long as you have the tool in the middle that translates it from, hey, I'm a human being, I can sort of write this, but I can't just type out zeros and ones all day. <laughs> Make sense? We prefer to write in Java or C++ or whatever, we prefer that world. But if you're not gonna let us play in that sandbox and then rely on a compiler to give us assembly language, and you're going to say instead you have to program at the assembly level at the very least we're using human characters not just tapping out zeros and ones okay so one thing for us to just say from this uh this particular slide and, and i'm not going to spend very much time on this is this one statement right here all instructions are conditional in um uh, uh arm we'll see this through an example all right so kind of the conditions the brand statements are built into the instructions all right i think at the end of class last time i kind of like quickly turboed through this real quick let's just do that again just as a reminder before i start getting into some more um assembly stuff but effectively um we are uh comparing two things so we're gonna have something in r0 one of our registers something in r1 and if we're using a different assembler maybe that's uh what was it a0 a1 or a1 a2 yeah whatever it is so we're you this assembly looks like it is based on either uh, standard or gcc based on what the slide above said okay but whatever it is we're presuming we're going to use the correct assembler to turn it into actual uh, uh arm instructions so we're going to have Two of our registers get some values loaded into them. Um, really, well, they already have values loaded into them, presumably. They show us here that uh, um, what R2 is equal to the max of R0 and R1. Um, so presumably they're set someplace else, whatever. Um, so we're going to compare two things and then we're going to branch if R0 is less than R1. So branch is like an if statement. If R0 less than R1, jump to LB max, jump to this label that this guy, do this code. Otherwise, just keep trucking. Move into R2, the value of R0. Then go ahead and just branch unconditionally to rest. So this branch uh, in an older school uh, assembly would have been like a go-to command. Like we're just saying, look, 
I, we're not branching up less. Galib, the lights. <laughs> there we go. All right, so, you know, we're not branching of less than if we did up, like we did up here. We're just saying, look, if you made it to this line, go to L rest, branch there, go there. That will skip past this and get to the code here. All right, that makes sense, the, the rough nature of uh, assembly code. So it's just example assembly code. All right, so I put this website on here, which I'm pulling a lot of the stuff that we're talking about next um, from. So this is in the slides that are up on uh, um, Blackboard. Uh, and we'll actually be using the uh, assembler on here rather than installing our own when we go to write some of this stuff. Uh, but let's kind of talk about some of the precursor things. Your homework for Monday will probably be to write, we'll have to see where we get here, but probably not to use the actual assembler, but to write some sample assembly code, something along these lines, but let's see where we go. All right, so we've kind of talked about this, and this was this was a slide I referenced just a, a few minutes ago when you asked me the difference between a compiler and an assembler. So we have our assembly code that we wrote inside of this program.s text file. All right, this is just some file that has some assembly code written in it. And presumably this assembler, AS, knows how to translate whatever language we wrote in here into something that's going to be useful for our actual processor. So we're making the presumption here that we're using an assembler that knows how to translate the version of ARM uh, that we're writing, you know, the ARM assembly into actual ARM instructions. All right, so this is the assembly program, the assembler. Here's our source code that we wrote. The output will be program.o, which should be zeros and ones stuff. Okay, so this guy translates from our low level assembly code into machine code. Can't quite execute it yet though. We don't have the thing that loads it onto the CPU. Okay, we don't have that piece. All right, but now we have machine code. This is the guy we don't wanna write by hand, this program.o we will begrudgingly write this one by hand, okay? The next thing is we use our linker. The linker, we're gonna take the output of this guy, program.o, and we're gonna create an output file called program. This is our actual executable. This is the guy that knows how to run on the CPU. Does that make sense? All right, so this translates from low level to machine level, this, turns machine level into something that will actually run on this operating system. So the correct kind of executable, a .exe for Windows. Uh, um, yeah, it's a, uh, uh, no, DMG is a disk image uh, in Mac. Uh, what's the name of the uh, ELF, ELF 16, ELF 32 format is a POSIX based system. Um, relatively unimportant for us, it's the, uh, the type of executable the operating system supports. So the operating system said, hey, you double clicked on your program called program, or if you're on Linux, you said dot slash program, and you pressed enter, you said, please launch this program. The OS then takes over and says, ah, I know how to deal with this because it was linked to the right kind of thing, and it starts running it, okay? Maybe on one core, maybe on multiple cores, that's up to the operating system, how it's gonna schedule it and all that stuff, but it will run it. Okay, so this is that process of going from assembly to machine, the machine to executable. All right, so um, if we look at ARM instructions generically, so here's just a generic format for a um, ARM instruction. So we have some mnemonic and we look at them down here. So a mnemonic is a short name for of the instruction. So we saw a couple up here like move MOV, move something from one place in memory to another one, compare some things, branch if less than, these are the mnemonics that hopefully kind of have a meaning to them when you look at them. All right, then the next part, this S is an optional suffix. If S is specified, the condition flag. So you could have like a, um, like a move I don't know if this actually exists in ARM, but let me just give you an example in I386. There's a normal move, 
which allows you to move into a register the value from another register. And then there's a move I, which allows you to move into a register an immediate value, like a five. I can move into R0, the number five, something like that. So this S thing here says, some of our mnemonics will have maybe a couple of versions that allow you to, to do something specific to that particular magic trick. All right, then we have this condition. Condition um, would need to be met in order for the instruction to fire. Okay, and that's what I said, uh, what, the previous slide or two slides ago? Previous slide, two slides ago, three slides ago, four slides ago. Uh, all instructions are conditional, right? So in uh, ARM, we can build into a single instruction. This is what I want to do, but only if this condition is met. Where in um, Intel-based assembly, i386-based assembly, we would have to uh, maybe sp split that across a couple of instructions. You know, where we'd have to say, if some condition is met, then do this con do this uh, uh, instruction, where that condition piece is built into um, assembly or ARM rather. All right, so that's the condition portion. All right. So the next piece is this is our destination. Whatever this guy is, presuming it should happen, we're putting something here. This is where the, the, the result will go into this destination. All right, then we have operand one and operand two. So not all instructions will need two operands. Some will need only one. So maybe I'm going to move into uh, R0, the number five. In that case, I don't need that second operand. All right, um, but this is our arguments. Yep, they're like arguments to a function. Yeah, so this guy is the name of the function. This says only perform this function if some condition is met. This says, where do I put the results of my function call? And this says, these are the parameters of the function call. Okay, so this is just the cadence of how uh, ARM works. ARM instructions look like this. Okay, make some sense? All right. And then here are some examples of mnemonics that exist. So I've used the, uh, the move commands. So we have a move, we have a move in the gate, um, we have an add, we have a subtraction, we have a multipl multiplication, we have a left shift, we have a right shift. Um, oh, these are logical and arithmetic uh, shifts. So logical would do it based on um, uh, ors or ands, uh, where arithmetic would do it based on a number. Um, rotate right, uh, compare, bitwise and, bitwise or, uh, bitwise xor or zor, however you want to pronounce it. I always say xor, but I, know, the, I think the I think the com the current thing people do say zor. I think we, yeah. Um, So that's the exclusive or one or the other, but not both, as opposed to normal or that says one or the other or both. Loads and stores, we're going to talk about those next. Um, uh, load multiple, store multiple. Um, we have stack instructions. Most architectures support some kind of stack data structure, which is the last in, first out uh, data structure. Think of it like a stack of magazines. The last magazine you put on top would be the first one you take off the top. Otherwise, you not that anybody has magazines anymore, <laughs> but whatever, they still arrive in the mail, right? Every single, I'm a golfer. So every single time you buy a new piece of equipment or something like that, you, you get a, a free membership to a 12 month membership for golf digest or something like that. Then they charge you for it a year later when you've forgotten. So uh, we have the ability to push and pop from stacks. We can branch, so jump to another place in the program. We can uh, branch and link. We can branch and exchange. We can branch with link and exchange. We can perform a system call related to the operating system. These are just some of them, right? I've referenced these guys as magic tricks, right? Our CPU knows how to perform a bunch of magic tricks. So each of these would be an example of one of the magic tricks. All right, now um, let's talk about load and store. Way back when, is it? Is 
the fish? Yes. So way back when we kind of talked about the relationship between some of these things, right? So we talked about our processor, which is where these registers live. So the processors have these little tiny, super fast memory locations where we can store bits of data. And then we have our system memory. And there's a relationship between those two. The system memory is kind of our staging area. We talked last time about how the CPU is kind of like Pac-Man, right? And um, our RAM is, is the buffet that Pac-Man eats from, okay? So there is a, um, a direct relationship between uh, the CPU and our system memory. Uh, so when we want to store something from the CPU, we are moving something from the CPU and storing it into memory, system memory. If we want to load something, we are moving something from system memory into the CPU. So store, write something to system memory, load, read something from system memory into a destination. So a store, the destination would be a bucket of memory. A load, the destination would be a register on the CPU. Uh, uh, uh. Let's see. So as an example, we can uh, say here, we can load into a register. What's our destination register R2? And what are we loading it from? Well, presumably R0 holds an address. So we've loaded a memory address into R0. R0 and then we're gonna say, get me from memory, the value that lives at the memory address that R0 has and load that value into R2. Read from memory something from this address and put it here, okay? Store says store into R2. Uh, actually, this is written, this doesn't seem to follow the mnemonic from the previous thing. This thing says store, the destination is this guy in this case or a store, because I'm saying store whatever's in R2 back into memory in R1. Right. So what is this? what do these two lines ultimately do? We copy whatever's in memory at, R, at address R0 into memory at address R1. That's what these two lines do. And the way that copy occurs is we bring it from memory into a register and then write it from a register back to a different place in memory. Ultimately, we have two places in memory with the same value. But I, I wonder actually, is this a uh, remove from where? Like this guy? It's still in memory. Yep. So he asked, is this when I when I load it into R2, does this place in memory get emptied? It does not. Yep. This is just saying, hey, I'm gonna copy the address, found copy the value found at memory address stored in R2 into, uh, or stored in R0 into R2. Then I'm going to store into this memory address in memory, whatever I, whatever I just read from R0. Uh, what I was complaining about here, and, and let's presume that the, the syntax here is, is correct, because they seem to mimic it again over here. This kind of breaks the rule of how the mnemonics work where we have our destination, the registered destination for storing the result. Because in this case, the destination is actually this place. And this is the source for the value I'm gonna store. So maybe a store value is just a, a special case or something like that. All right, so if we kind of look at a real um, assembly program here, um, we have a couple of, uh, so up top we have this data section. So data section is where we define our variables. Okay, so we have a variable called var1, it's equal to three. We have a variable called var2, it's equal to four. Okay, so that's the values those guys will have. Um, Notice down here, we have the address 
of these guys. The address of var1 will be stored in this guy. The address of var2 will be stored in this guy. Okay, so really we have four different variables. We just have address space here at the bottom. So define two variables, define the address of those two variables down there. We have four variables we can work with. Okay, now we tell our program to start. So really the meat of our program lives in here. So what are we doing first? We're going to load into R0 the value found, effectively the value of var1 by grabbing the address of var1 and putting it into, uh, actually, we're not getting the value, we're getting the memory address directly. We don't have those little brackets around this. So this is saying put into R0 the memory address of var1. Not the value that lives at that memory address, the memory address itself. So R0 will be equal to the memory address of R1. R1 will be equal to the memory address of R2. Then R2 will be equal to the value of what lives at R0, which is the address of R1. So this is where we'll get the value of R2, um, which is a three. Make sense? So R2, we'll get the value that lives at bucket R0, memory address R0 in memory. And R0 holds the address of R1. Okay. So we're saying go to memory, to the address of R1, store that address inside of R0. The third line here says load into R2, the value found at that memory address. This next line says store into R1, the actual address of R2. This last line says, store into R2, the uh, value found, um, actually, this will be store, not into R2, store at this memory address in var2, the value that I have in R2, which is the var1's value. So what do these four lines ultimately do? So if you look at those four lines, what is the output of that? What, what's the state? of my computer after I've run this program. Well, the, well, the output, the, what's the computer look like afterwards? The only, because the user is not going to see anything based on this, right? Really two things might be changing. We have the values of registers and then we have the values stored in memory. Those are the two things that uh, have state here. So when this program first starts, we have three and four loaded in memory at these two addresses, right? So the number three and the number four are loaded in memory at these two addresses. What I'm asking is what's the state of memory after these four lines are executed? What's changed in memory after those four lines? Variable two. All right, what about variable two? It was actually four, but after copying it, it's three right now. Yep. So var one started off as three, var two started off as four. And these guys live somewhere in memory. After these four lines, what have we done? We've overwritten this four with a three. That happened right here. I stored back into memory. What part of memory? the place where var2 lives. And what did I store there? The value of var1, which I loaded into r2 here. So I loaded a three into r2, and then I stored that three into var2 in memory. Make sense? All right, so when you walk through it, you see how it actually isn't that difficult but you got us, you got to walk through it one line at a time. We feel like we're not accomplishing that much. Each one of these is a little magic trick. And when you add up these magic tricks, something real has happened. Okay. This looks like a lot of mumbo jumbo right here, but ultimately all we've done is overwritten this four with a three in memory. Where if we were writing this in Java, we would have said, you know, int var one is equal to three, int var two is equal to four, var two is equal to var one overwriting them, right? <laughs> That's the equivalent if we wrote it in Java. 
actually not substantially more more lines of code uh or less lines of code it is less but not like shockingly less for something so simple as this but we probably like saying um var 2 is equal to var 1 better than all this memory swapping stuff all right so this kind of takes you through assuming assuming you're allowed to write in a high level language like java and python if you're not instead you're forced to write this yeah. this would usually be in our in the in the usual world this is the output of a compiler right so in the usual world we'd write this in java compile it it would turn it into something like this which we could then go in and modify um you know some examples of why you might modify assembly code. Let's say you are working on a video game. You've written it in C++, you've compiled it. And let's just say, since, since C++ is a strongly typed language, if you advertise that um, a function has to return a value, let's say, um, you would have to write some code that would output some branches in it that might say, well, if this is true, return the value, otherwise return null or something like that. That might be the high level code you have to write, but maybe you just happen to know this, let's say this part of the game is, you know, has a lot of stuff going on. You need it to be as fast as possible, this part of the game. So let's just say as the human being who's writing this, you're saying, look, I know that this condition will never happen. C++ made me write the high level code so that it knew that this function will definitely return a value but I know it would return a value anyways. So I don't really want it to be wrapped in an if statement. That's an extra step. That's an extra question I have to ask at runtime. The human being in me just knows the problem I'm solving and I know that a value, uh, um, uh, that, that I'll always have a value here. So I can go into the assembly code and modify it to remove the conditional and remove the branch if true uh, part of it and just say, here's the one line I want you to do. This is what you will always do. But you couldn't have pulled that off at the high level language. You were at the mercy of the rules of C++. All right, make some sense? All right, so what I'll do for your homework assignment write some assembly code that loads the numbers one through three into registers R0, R1, and R, well, let's see, into three variables. And then reverses those variables in memory. So ultimately, var1 would be equal to 1, var2 is equal to 2, var3 is equal to 3. So this is the starting state. var1 is equal to 3, var2 is equal to 2, var1 is equal to 1, ending state. And you'll want to operate off of this example as this. So I'm not asking you to test it or anything, just start with this as your base and modify this to accomplish what I'm asking you to accomplish right here. Okay. Just text file. Just text file. Okay. You can even paste it into uh, uh, Blackboard. All right, questions, comments, concerns, bribes. Can you go All back right. to previous slide? Who what? The this assembly one? example. This one? Previous. So what does the IDR stand for? Uh, no, in the next one over. No, the assembly. Yes. 
This is so. Uh, what is this? This is load. IDR. It's not a. It's okay. LDR. Load. Load register. Load this address into this register. And it says it right next to it. Load the memory address of R1 via label address var one into R0. And in the third line, the R2 is stored into R0? No, I'm loading the value stored at a memory address in R0 uh, into register R2. So go back through in the video and watch when we walk through this, we say what each line does and then there's a little comment over here that also says it. Loads move something from memory into a register or um, loads move things into registers, stores move things into memory. That's the difference between those two. Okay, and these slides are up on Blackboard. You have a link to the, the slides so you can go and look at these uh, uh, offline. Okay. All right, I will see everybody on Monday.